welcome back to Studio 10. Today we are discussing the results of the European election in Ireland. We will explore the implications of the European election, we will break down the results and analyse what this means for the country moving forward. With you as always on these occasions, Nicholas Lesnia, Toilet Community Group, Toilet Studio 10, let's speak EU. In the aftermath of the European election in Ireland, tensions are high as the results start to come in. The established parties are facing off competition from newer, more progressive candidates who have been gaining traction with voters disillusioned with the status quo. As the votes are counted, it becomes clear that there has been a seismic shift in Irish politics. The Green Party has seen a surge in support with their candidates winning a record number of seats. Their message of tackling climate change and preserving the environment has struck a chord with voters who are increasingly concerned about the future of our planet. Meanwhile, the traditional parties are left reeling as their share of the vote dwindles. Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, once dominant forces in Irish politics, are now facing the reality of being eclipsed by newer, more dynamic parties. In the last European election, Sinn Féin managed to secure three seats in the European Parliament. The party's strong showing reflected the growing support for their pro-Irish unity and anti-Brexit stance. Sinn Féin's MEPs used their positions to push for greater representation and support for Irish interests within the European Union. Independent candidates fared well, with several securing seats. Notable among these was Mick Wallace, a former developer and political activist who won a seat in Ireland South. Wallace's unorthodox approach to politics and his focus on issues such as climate change and social justice resonated with the voters, leading to his successful election. Other independent candidates, such as Luke Ming Flanagan and Claire Daly, also performed strongly, reflecting a growing trend of voters turning away from traditional political parties in favour of more independent voices. Overall, the success of independent candidates in the European election signalled a shift in Irish politics towards a more diverse and inclusive representation. Hello and welcome to part two of our Communicating EU EU Safety Programme here on Twilight Community Group, Twilight Studio 10. Nicholas Lesnia greets you as always on these occasions and our today's guest is a newly elected MEP, Kathleen Function. How are you Kathleen? Good thanks, yeah, thanks for having me on. Kathleen, how have the last few weeks been for you? How are you adapting to your new role? Yeah, so it's been interesting, um, busy. There's a lot to, to learn and take in. It's kind of like with any new role or new job. But I think, I suppose with politics, it's a little bit different because people sometimes expect that you'll know straight away everything, but you won't, obviously. Um, and I had been a TD for eight years, so I felt I really knew that that role very well. So it's, there was a lot like finishing up one job, getting settled into a new one, but it's exciting as well. A little bit overwhelming, um, if I'm being really honest, but it's a great opportunity and I'm really looking forward to the next five years and being able to really get into the role. Okay, and what, what changes would you like to see happen in the current term of the European Parliament? Well, I'd like to see Europe become a bit more relevant to people's lives. Um, most people in the election gone past would say that they don't really feel a, a strong connection with the European Union. Um, when we have a national election for government, people tend to get really engaged. Even local elections, people kind of tend to think they know their local councillor, they want to know their local councillor for local issues. Sometimes the EU seems a bit removed, and yet 70% of our legislation actually starts at the European Union. So um, I think it's important that we have a range of voices um, at EU level that are willing to scrutinise whatever legislation is coming forward, um, be critical when it's needed, um, obviously be supportive when it's needed too, but I do think it's important that uh, there's a range of experiences, I suppose, examining legislation and making sure in particular that it works for ordinary families, ordinary people and communities and that it's not just focused on one particular group of people and a lot of people, I think, feel that politics doesn't really represent them and doesn't serve them very well. So it's good to have um, different voices and hopefully that will be my key focus, will be trying to engage as much as possible with, with people 
it's obviously a large constituency, it's 10 counties, but um, it would be really important for me to try and, you know, talk to people, see what exactly they want from the, the European Union and how we can kind of better make that connection and joined up, I suppose. And Kathleen, going back to the beginning of your career, you are a member of the Kilkenny Borough Council from 2009 to 2014, yeah. then uh, Kilkenny County Council. How do you recall the time in your career? In your career? Yeah, so I actually never thought I'd be involved in politics. Um, it wasn't a role that I, I never had a great ambition to be a politician. Um, I got involved with Sinn Féin and then I was asked would I run for the 2007 general election. I said absolutely no way, I don't want to do it, I don't want to go on the radio. Th those were my exact words. I couldn't imagine myself in a kind of a public role. Um, but eventually I said yes and then didn't get elected obviously in 2007 but did in 2009. Um, and while it was, it was five years where I was the only Sinn Féin uh, councillor, so it was difficult in one way. But it actually has some of my best memories of being involved in politics because the borough councils, I think, worked really well. It was all of Kilkenny City working together. There was 12 councillors um, and I feel that the group that was there at the time um, really was interested in, in kind of making sure that Kilkenny <coughs> was served well and was really all about the best interests of the city. Um, and while obviously the county council has, a, has a, a crucial role as well, I do feel that when they got rid of borough councils and town councils, that that did damage some towns and cities in terms of representation. Um, but yeah, so it was like it's always been each part that I've done, whether it's local or national or now this, it's always been really interesting um, for different reasons. But it's it it was all it was good as well to to finally I suppose have a Sinn Féin person on the council and to to make that breakthrough and to kind of you know try and grow from there. And do you feel that at the moment all parts of the Kilkenny constituency are represented equally on the county council? Well, I suppose geographically you could argue that they are represented. I would say, um, and I understand we just had an election, and obviously you know everyone has their opportunity to vote. Um, I would be disappointed with the turnout that we had in the most recent election and I would think that there's a lot of voices actually not represented um, on our local councils as a result of, like, I don't think we have a lot of, I suppose, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael elected again. Um, they're the, the current government parties um, and I think maybe they're overrepresented. I do understand that they were elected. so. Obviously, we have to respect that, but my own personal opinion is I'd like to see a little bit more diversity um, on the on the local authorities, not just in Kilkenny, but there's lots of councils that we need to see that on too. We need to see lots of different voices and lots of different experiences. Um, you know, too much we have kind of the traditional politician and that I think needs to change, you know. Okay, and you were elected a TD in 2016 and you stayed in your role in Donna Hare until earlier this year. Yeah. What would you say you were most proud of during all those years in, in Donna Hare? Yeah, so that's a really good question actually. There, there's so many different things that you do, like in terms of maybe just dealing with individuals or dealing with groups that always, you know, it's fantastic when you've been able to help somebody with something. That feeling is great. Um, but I suppose the, the two things in particular in relation to the doll for me would be um, getting to chair the Children's Committee um, and the work that we did with the mother and baby home survivors um, that was particularly uh, kind of poignant and emotional and um, a very difficult time in Irish history. And I suppose just getting to actually meet so many survivors of those institutions and try and have their voices heard and their stories heard and some sort of justice um, for them now there's a lot more that has to be done in relation to that but that was one thing that I felt particularly I suppose honoured to be involved in um, and then regards our own party just developing our own policy in relation to the early years and the child co child care sector um, that was something as well that I was really glad to be able to be involved in but there's lots of stuff I suppose that you would point to kind of um, individuals that you've been able to maybe help or assist and that always is is a rewarding day as well. Okay and in part one of our programme here we ask local people on the streets of Kilkenny and Carlow 
about the changes that they would like to be that they would like to see being done here in the constituency and the one word that was in every single answer was housing oh yeah and this crisis be resolved with the aid of the european union do you think yeah so housing is definitely a major issue it's the, actually the one issue from the time i was on the council in 09 to now it consistently it's the number one issue that people come into the office about um i think we need a change of government to change to, to actually help and assist with the housing situation um, there is some supports there from a European Union, various funds. However, it really does have to be driven by national government. Um, we probably will have a general election maybe later this year, certainly by March 2025 at the latest. And I would be hoping that Sinn Féin have an opportunity to be in that government because I think that's the only way that we're going to see any changes in housing. There's been way too much dependency on the private rental sector. Um, you know, people cannot find places to rent. Mm -hmm. And then if you are on the social housing list and you qualify for the HAP payment, it's a harder task again to find somewhere. Um, and the, the rents that people are paying now far exceed what a lot of people are paying in a mortgage. And yet people can't qualify for a mortgage because they can't save, it's like a vicious circle. Um, so housing is definitely a major issue, but I think we need to change the government um, there is some assistance from the EU, but I think it's mainly a change of government that we're going to need to see to help that. And what other changes would you like to achieve in this constituency? I suppose like the key thing would be the, the connection um, with the European Union. I also think that there is various funding streams there, potentially that we're not tapping into. One of the committees that I'm going to be on in the European Union is the Reggie Committee, which is in relation to balanced regional development. So I'd be hoping to look um, to see is there potential funding for the South East. We know the South East as a region has always kind of been forgotten about and does quite poorly in terms of, you know, employment figures and everything like that. So I suppose that would be one of the, the key things as well. And of course, I did a bit of research before today's interview and I noticed that in a public appearance at the European uh, Union election debate, you said people are being failed. That's a quote from you. What did you mean by those words? That people are being failed by Europe currently. Well, those are those are the words that you said in the European election debate. Yeah. Before the election, I'm just wondering what did you mean exactly by those words? Well, I think I suppose I'd have to know exactly which debate you're you're talking about because that's obviously only one sentence. But um, in general, I think like the political system is failing people, whether it's at local level, national level, or at European level. I, and I think people themselves. I imagine when you did your box pop of what people want to see. One of the key things I imagine would be that people feel that they're not represented or that they don't even understand the, the system. I imagine there were some people that didn't even realize there was an election going on. So like if there's a disconnect like that, people are obviously being failed. Um, but I think in general, like I feel quite strongly that we haven't had the representation that we need. We've had an over-reliance on a local level and a national level on Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael um, and they tend to be a lot of the the MEPs as well that we've had over the years, government party MEPs. So I suppose myself and my colleague Lynn Boylan and there's a few others there as well that are not government MEPs will be trying our best to ensure that I suppose the voices of, of ordinary people are heard. Of course and the world of politics is seeing a slight right turn yeah. at the moment with the likes of Netherlands, Argentina or growing support for parties like the AFD in Germany. What is this happening in your opinion? Yeah, so I think there's there's obviously a bit of a disenfranchisement and people feel disconnected. Um, it is, I suppose then you could look at the situation in other countries and having a Labour government in England, which is a positive. Um, and I think we do need to kind of hang on to those positives at times like this, because we need unity. Um, I think it's really important that a lot of times this comes from underinvestment in communities and then people kind of get angry. Um, they sometimes believe misinformation that's being spun. Like if you look at the Brexit, during Brexit, it's a good example of it. There was a whole load of talk during that referendum that if people voted for Brexit, all of a sudden there would be extra money for their national health system. And literally a day after Brexit was passed, nobody spoke about that because it wasn't true. So like 
social media and kind of the way things have changed is a good thing in 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 certain ways right it's great for families people to be able to stay in contact it's great for you know i use it as a political forum particularly let's say to get your speeches to get your message out but yet there doesn't seem to be any sort of regulation on when when information is totally false when it's totally incorrect and it just gets shared and shared and shared as if it's fact and i think that a lot of people who already feel maybe forgotten about or let down or that they've been failed by various governments, whether it's local or national or, or European level, they tend to maybe latch on to that. Um, and it's not the only reason, but I think it's it's one of the reasons potentially. Okay, and Sinn Féin has introduced a bill a few years back if, in 2021, if I'm, if I'm right, um, to lower the voting age to 16 years. Yeah. Is this a good idea in your opinion? Yeah, well, that's something that we've been kind of campaigning for for a number of years. Um, I certainly think I'm always really impressed when you go to any schools or any de debates or talks with young people, um, very clued in, very knowledgeable. Um, so yeah, it's something that we've been we've been kind of pushing for. Um, I I don't believe I'm not sure if we'll see that pass in, in any time in the near future. But it's, uh, it's certainly something that we believe young people should be involved and should have their voices heard. Okay, and I know you have a great interest in the health sector yourself, and uh, but I would like to focus specifically on mental health now, um, because since the pandemic of 2019, we are seeing an increase in young people seeking mental health services in Ireland. Do you think that in Ireland they are receiving adequate levels of support at the moment? Um, no, absolutely not. I think there are some really good services um, and some really good people working within the services that are literally working beyond their capacity even. Um, but I think it's very difficult to access mental health services. Uh, we're still really reliant on a lot of our kind of volunteer services um, and on our, the charity services, which obviously do great work, but they shouldn't have to, you know, kind of carry everything. So there, it should it should needs to be a lot more, I suppose, like a lot easier for people to access services. Like if you go to a GP, usually you're on a waiting list. If you present an accident and emergency, you know there's a whole process, and a lot of the time people will tell you, just anecdotally, that you know medication is kind of presented as mm -hmm. rather than actual maybe counselling or or psychology type services. So I, I think it needs to be um, easier. I'm a massive advocate for play therapy. That's obviously for much younger kids, but I think it's a really good start. Um, and there, you know, there does need to be greater access to support services, I think, in school. So there is a program called the School Completion Program, where um, basically it, it gives supports, helps, breakfast clubs, maybe summer camps, different things like that, homework clubs, but they also, in certain uh, school completion programs can provide counselling services. And I think that should be something that's available in all schools um, because I just think it's it's invaluable. Now, I know not everything is about school and not everything is about, not everyone maybe stays in school and all the rest of it, but I think it would be a very good starting point if people were able to access counselling services through school. That wasn't obviously career guidance. Uh, that's a whole other thing. And I think sometimes people maybe are are pointed in that direction as if that's the solution. Uh, so there, there needs to be a lot more, uh, I think maybe consultation as well with young people who have come through the mental health services to see what changes that they would like to see. It's very interesting that you mentioned school because actually in a, in a study based back in 2021, uh, um, around 61% of Irish children said that school related issues have affected their mental health negatively. Mm. How can this be resolved? Yeah, so I think there's a lot to, in relation to that. So 2021, that's obviously kind of just coming out of COVID. I think that had a massive impact on young people and on children's ability. Like all one day you were in school, next day you weren't. And then I think for a lot of kids, when they did go back, they felt there had been such a gap and they found it difficult to adjust back in. So um, I think we need to change a lot about how we uh, to kind of do our, our studying here in Ireland. Um, the Leaving Cert 
I personally think there's way too much pressure. There's way too much about one year, about one set of exams. I think we need, there has been some continuous assessment brought in, but there needs to be a lot more in relation to that. And then I suppose, like I said, if, if they were able to access counselling services and if there was a, a wider range of things as well, like it's very academic. There's a lot more skills than just academic. Um, I think that we need to look at kind of like, you know, life skills and other various things that could be taught and introduced in schools, which would be, which would benefit uh, some students. Like not everybody is, is uh, academic and I, there's far too much of a, an emphasis on that. Now you have mentioned um, volunteer counselling services, but I would like to focus on the national ones. The transition from CAMS or the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service to an adult mental health service can be a very difficult one for young people. Yeah. What can we do on a community and political level to make this process easier for them? Well, there probably needs to be more of a sort of um, a graduated programme rather than you just literally one day are on one list. And what hap often happens to people as well is they're on a list, then they, what they call, age out of the services because they turn 18. And um, so there probably needs to be a lot, much more of a graduation so that you don't just literally stop at one service one day. And uh, uh, but also in terms of beds, uh, bed spaces, you know, there's been huge criticism of children being uh, put into adult psychiatric wards because so many of the children's one beds have been closed. So I would say that we need to maximise any of the bed capacity that we have and ensure then that there's maybe like a transition service for want of better words where people maybe you know when you turn 18 for the first um you obviously have to consult consult with the sector and consult with people themselves but you know that you would have maybe a year or two of a transition period rather than just going literally from one to the other okay and is the youth's voice heard in, in the european parliament um well i suppose we've only had two weeks of sittings that i've been involved in so i don't I think I suppose it would be fair if I was to say mm -hmm. um, right now in terms of my own experience because I'm only after starting but certainly from speaking to people in during the campaign and from my own you know somewhat interaction with it I would say a lot of people would say that no it isn't um, so that's something that that needs to certainly be looked at as well. And how can we encourage more young people to be interested in politics? That's a good question. Um, of course, we are seeing new subjects being brought into yeah. school, um, focusing strictly on the education yeah. point, point of view, but what, what else can we do? Mm. Yeah, well, definitely, I think the um, the politics and society course that was brought in for Leave Insert has made a, a massive difference. Um, I've just as one particular school, I won't name it, but they are very good here in Kilkenny. And I initially went in when they started that programme in transition year and did like a year, we, not just me, it was other politicians as well. And you can see as the years progress, how people are getting more and more engaged and more interested. Um, but I think there's only two schools in Kilkenny City, for example, that offer that course. So I think it needs to be, if you, if you have an interest in doing that, I think you should be able to do it for your leave insert. Um, and then I, maybe there needs to be more in terms of actual engagement with, from politicians to schools and vice versa. Some schools are great at inviting politicians in, others never look to do it. Um, same with trips to the Dáil, uh, stuff like that, I suppose, you know. Okay, and of course at the moment we are seeing a big um, immig immigration crisis here in Europe at the moment, so I would like to ask what is your party's view on the EU uh, immigration policy? Yeah, so we didn't support the EU migration pact um, there's a lot of things in there that we don't agree with um, in terms of human rights. So, you know, it has to be a human rights compliant approach. Um, and also, I think it's really important for a national government to be involved. Um, one of my motivations, I suppose, for running for the European election was I feel often national politicians will say, oh, that's Europe, as if like it's nothing to do with us and we can't do anything about it. And I don't think we should allow I suppose a situation to develop where that can be said. Um, we need to do an awful lot more um, in terms of how we're dealing with the situation. It's not right for people to be 
you know, literally in on the side of the street in tents. It's totally unacceptable. And I think that there has been enough time for the government to get some sort of a plan in place. And I think the vast majority of people want to see just a fair system that works for people. And I don't think that that's uh, rocket science or that that's asking too much. Okay, and I would like to ask you about people such as myself who have been living, who, have, who are coming from a migrant background who have been living in Ireland for 15, 20, sometimes 30 years. Mm. But people like this um, coming from Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Asia, and Africa, all over the world are um, experiencing at the moment an increase in the levels of discrimination and racism against them. Um, what can we do to help these people? Yeah, so I think we need to be um, have a much more tougher attitude towards racism and have like a zero tolerance type of approach to to racism. Um, I actually think it's my own family has a huge history of of you know people going back and forth to different countries. We spent our whole lives you know saying goodbye to various people at airports. Um, so I just have no kind of tolerance for racism at all. It really actually makes my blood boil to see some of the nonsense that we've seen in the last while. Um, there definitely needs to be a lot more tackling of misinformation. I do think, I know like sometimes you hear that and you think oh, people say that because it's an easy thing to say, but I really do feel that there is times where people are totally misinformed. Um, and I think we need to remind people as well that they have a certain level of personal responsibility when you're on forums that are social media, that's a public forum. You should not be just sharing stuff that you don't know, is this factually correct? Um, so there's, you know, education I think as well is a big thing in terms of, um, you know, helping to tackle some of that. Um, and then like, you know, is there enough being done in relation to kind of integration and stuff? A lot of people would say they probably don't feel that there is, that they don't feel maybe that there is uh, enough of outreach and, and where do you go or where do you start when you're new to a community? Like what's the first step in that? And we've seen some great examples, probably in parts of Dublin, um, that I can think of off the top of my head, you know, where there was really good integration programmes and, you know, it's it's been really successful. So we need to look at where things have worked and what can you do um, in relation to that. But I think we need to be much the law like it needs to be much harsher on on um it feels like sometimes people get away with saying stuff that they shouldn't be getting away with saying i suppose okay um, do you feel that there is enough initiatives out there at the moment promoting support of our seniors here in ireland i am um, i think there's some really good communities doing great work um and there's some really good kind of volunteer programs but they probably are not being given the support they need in terms of maybe funding and actually like you will always need money behind a program for it to work and I think that's probably where there needs to be like sometimes I think people can say oh we're going to have an integration program for example and it sounds great and it's on paper but is it actually really being funded properly to to do what it, you know it should be doing as such so I think that that's probably uh, and I probably need to, would, would need to speak with more groups to, to give a really detailed and honest answer. But uh, that's kind of just my own view on it, I suppose. Okay, and are there any initiatives that you would like to see implemented by the European Union to maybe promote the development and integration of our seniors in the realities of today's life? Um, well, I suppose, like, a lot of it comes down to funding. You know, I mean, the EU budget, like, we're... For a long time, Ireland was uh, kind of a beneficiary and now we're a net contributor to the EU budget. But I think that means then that you know, we should be able to access funding for groups. And I think maybe it needs to be a little bit easier um, in terms of actually how you go about getting funding and the like, application processes. And, you know, I think at one point or, or there, there was an idea of having somebody in each area that would be able to that would be a go-to person in relation to European funding, you know, projects like that. I think would be important in terms of, uh, you know, kind of realize making sure I suppose that that the funding actually does go to groups, you know, and that it's not just it sounds like there's a load of money out there, but you know, is it actually being accessed by the people that need it? 
Okay, Kathleen, and numerous people, and especially students here in Ireland, are looking at the European Union from the perspective of programmes such as the Erasmus Plus. Do you feel that these programmes are easily accessible to people of Ireland? Okay, so I don't know a huge amount about the Erasmus Plus, mm -hmm. to be honest, so okay. I don't want to give an answer and then someone says that's absolutely, totally wrong, so, no you know. Okay, we'll finish up here then. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Time. Thanks. Kathleen Function was our guest today on the EU50 Communicating Europe programme. Nicola Zarian Tolle and Community Group Twilight Studio 10. Thank you and see you in the next episode. I'm from Nigeria. The major question that I need to ask, you have already answered mostly about the about sexual section, but I really appreciate that. I just want to ask maybe what is the main important thing that is delaying the working permit for the asylum seeker? Yeah, so that's a good, very good question. Um, and I think it's really frustrating because people actually really want to work and there's so many sectors that actually really, really need uh, people to work. So like I often t say in politics, there's no common sense. And I find myself just saying that more and more, even in the last few weeks. So I actually think they will say that um, it's a lack of staff in the centre to process the applications. But to be honest, I'm not sure why that is still the case, because we know this for uh, a long time now. Um, and for nearly all my time in politics, there's been an issue of delays with work permits. So they've had a long time to speed it up. Um, I don't know if it's gotten any better. I don't think it has. Um, some people will say it, it has gotten a little bit better for certain sectors, depending on where you're trying to access employment. But um, I do think it's down to uh, staff an issue but I would say then that that's kind of down to a little bit of a lack of political will because um, if you look at during Covid how many things were able to be done really quickly really fast because the political will was there to do it so I always think when things are very delayed for a very long period of time it's because the, the political will is not there but I do think it's good to raise that and it's something that if we continuously raise it hopefully they will they will speed it up but i know we get a lot of queries into the office as well with people who've got jobs ready to go and they're waiting on the work permits okay thank you well, what about the transportation system i mean from one place to another uh, if you want to move it's not like the main problem the kenya is more different than other counties do you mean like around Kilkenny to get around like buses? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we have a really poor infrastructure um, in Ireland, I think, in general. Um, it's one thing that I've actually really noticed just in the last few weeks of uh, getting involved with the EU, like the train system, the bus system is, is so much more advanced. Are you working on it? Um, this this is not actually something that falls to the EU, to be really to be really honest with you and give you a very honest answer. Um, but it is something that we raised countless times when I was in national parliament. Um, I personally used to always give the example of even the service from Dublin to Kilkenny um, it, it was the exact same as when I was in college and when I was going to college in Dublin and coming from Dublin to Kilkenny, the service had not changed and that's like 20 years or more ago. So it is something that we would have raised, or I would have raised, let's say, when I was in national parliament and I know our Sinn Féin TDs will continue to raise because we have a bus service now around Kilkenny City that that's only developed in the last maybe three or four years up up to then there was no bus service around Kilkenny City so it is something that does need to be um, developed again I would say we need to a change of government to be really honest with you to, to improve it. I have two questions here one is according to the law change recently or probably I don't know if you you have done the interview you have to wait for a response before someone can have access to permit even if it takes time how can the european union help so that we will not be able to stay we will be sitting we'll not be sitting idle do you understand me yeah during that time frame during, during time frame well i think that that time frame needs to be sped up okay. to be honest like why should it take 
I mean, it's like if you're going for any type of an interview, you don't, you're not waiting months yeah. to get the answer. Um, so I think that it's very similar to the first question in terms of like staff. Yeah. But I, I think that actually the EU probably, like the national government, I would feel strongly that national government needs to have a strong role in this. But I do think there's times where the EU can kind of use its power as well to sort of say there should be um, a kind of criteria basically on like how long a process should take and it should be a reasonable amount of time. Um, to me, again, it's sort of this whole thing about the political will is not there to actually deal with the situation and therefore everything gets kicked down the road, you know. But I think, in ter sorry, just to answer, I suppose, very directly what you're saying in terms of the EU, I think that's something that we can potentially raise um, and see, you know, because that's obviously potentially relevant in, in lots of countries, not just Ireland, you know, and I think it's, it's only fair to people that there would be uh, you know, an acceptable time period, not something that goes on for indefinitely. Because yeah, recently, things changed. Yeah. Before when, let's say, people coming to seek asylum, at times they spend a year before they could get an interview, some spend lesser, but they will be given access to permit. Mm. But now, if you enter and let's say within a, a month, you have us, you, you're able to do the interview. You won't be able, you won't have access to anything until you, you until have. Until you know what the outcome. What the outcome. Yeah. But what I think is, why, why is it taking them so long for the outcome? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's, that's where I think it's failing. So I, I don't think there should be a delay in, in letting people know what the outcome is, personally. Okay. And I think that's something that, you know, now, like, I like to be as honest with people. We have two MEPs, myself and my colleague, Lynn Boylan in Dublin. So we are only two people. But I think it's important that whenever we have the opportunity to raise those issues that we do. And also, given the fact that we both were, Lynn was in the Senate, I was in the Dáil, and we're obviously in a party that's hoping to be in government. I think it's it's relevant to, to raise that too, in terms of us and our, with our colleagues and in the doll as well. And the second question is, in given status, some countries are prioritized. <coughs> like, some people are given more than some countries. Why is that? With the system of, is this through the temporary protection with Ukraine? Uh, yeah, when, when I was talking, the, the status meant when somebody are granted, some people are granted, uh, what I tell them status, like, of stand for. Yeah. Like you granted asylum status. Some people are prioritized. As in the when you come here the Irish system is treating countries differently. Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So why is that? And why why some countries I don't want to mention names. Yeah, yeah. Well I think I, I know think what we you're know. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these let's say in terms of percentage. 90 less than 90% of people, some people from countries, we, we have access to that. Mm. And some countries just probably 20% or 10%. Mm. And things, I don't think that is okay. Yeah. I agree with you. There shouldn't be. There, like, we've kind of created like a two tier system, yeah. which is really wrong. I think, uh, like, basically, I think what has happened is the government genuinely have made a mess of the whole situation. And instead of actually having a plan and having a fair system, they've just literally kind of been, we'll change it today, it'll be different tomorrow, next week, two weeks, and it's created a mess. And actually what happens then is you've created division amongst people. But, you know, the kind of cynical part, part of me is always thinks the old thing of divide and conquer. And when people are fighting with each other, they're not fighting on the actual problem, which is the government. Yeah. So sometimes I think it suits governments to, to you know, act like that, but I, I think in this instance they have, no, they never had, they didn't have a plan, and it has created just a situation where they're, they're changing the rules nearly. I wouldn't say on a daily basis, but every couple of weeks instead of actually putting a system in place that works for everyone, that's fair, you know, particularly around. Uh, people wanting to access employment when we're crying out for loads of different skills. 
in this country. It makes absolutely no sense for, for that to happen, you know. Um, another question, it's not part of the question though. Some people are included from their different country, like they have, like they know what to do. Some just sitting with all the package they have and they don't have access to anything. They are not given the opportunity or chance. Uh, let's say, talking of the Irish people, here is the work for the Irish. Here is work for immigrants. So I've been seeing that a lot. Yeah. How can that be adjusted? Is that though, do you, do you, are you saying that's more to do with some attitudes from people? Yeah. Like, yeah, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Look, I think that's, that's a, a difficult one because that obviously shouldn't be happening, but I suppose that comes down to education again, some of the stuff we were talking about in the, in the interview around, you know, that there, there is negative attitudes which are, which are wrong. We need to try and tackle that, you know, but um, it, it, that, is, that is, a, is a difficult one, but I, it doesn't make it right in any way, shape or form. I don't know, do I have a, a, a full answer in relation to that, but that we do need to, you know, be calling out any sort of negativity, racism, you know, as much as possible whenever we see it, you know. I, according to the man, said once they see your name, okay, this is so so, you should come from this place. So we are not going to give this one job. Yeah. We we'll give it to this. Yeah. So since that is happening a lot, I think if European Union can do something about it. And also, then there probably needs to be more awareness in terms of, like that's you know like there is certain rights in the workplace you know i used to work for a, a trade union before i was involved in politics and like there's a lot of things like that that are that yeah, that are legal p potentially and discrimination so m there probably needs to be a lot more awareness and i know um that there's like certain uh like the migrants rights center do a lot of work but i do i know that they're on a very small budget and a very small amount of staff so you know that's something that potentially um, I could follow up on in relation to. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching part two of the Communicating EU programme on Twilight Studio 10. It has been a pleasure to chat politics with you on these occasions. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe the channel. Nicholas Lesniak and Alina Holub, Twilight Community Group, Twilight Studio 10. See you soon.